So, uh, welcome everybody. Great to be here. Excited for fall. Excited for all that that brings. Uh, you know, football and disappointment, because like, whoa, all kinds of things there. But also super encouraging. Uh, Damon Coe from the School of Mines was baptized on uh, Friday night. So excited is, is, I don't know who Damon is. Is Damon here? So be ex super excited for Damon, who is not here. Uh, he's in the Springs with his family, so that's encouraging, but uh, it, it, encouraging just seeing what's going on there. I, uh, later on, I got something just for the mind students in my sermon. You're going to love it. Uh, see, if, see if you can figure out which part it is. I, I, it shouldn't be hard. But uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about a new series. And uh, I'm Hans Rasmussen, one of the evangelists here in the Denver Church of Christ, and we're really grateful that you're here. But we're going to start a little six-week journey uh, that we're embarking on here, a little expedition, as, you, as, you, as it were. And uh, it's one of the, the most profound and life-altering principles in the Bible. And the concept that we're going to explore isn't just this, like, abstract idea, right? It's not like ethereal. It's not just like, ooh, yeah. But it, it has some great practicals. And I think it's a transformational truth as well. And it really has the power to shape the very core of our existence and all that we do. And uh, what we're doing is we're calling this series, Home is Where the Heart Is, Right? And, uh, you know, the theme for this whole year is talking about home and uh, that Christ wants to live in our hearts and in our home and having this and all of that this entails. And we've kind of gone through this whole um, different series throughout the year talking about home. And what we want to talk about in this series over the next six weeks, so myself and then some of the elders and some of our board members are going to share some different things over the next few weeks. We're going to share some insights somewhat from a book called, from Randy Elkhorn called The Treasure Principle. And uh, in this book, he really does a great job unpacking the truth that lies in, in the heart of the Christian faith. And the idea is that our hearts are intrinsically tied to where we put our treasures and where, where we do it. And, uh, and so Jesus, in Matthew 6, 21, makes it really clear. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart is, will be also. And so there's times where you go, I wonder why my heart is drawn towards certain things. I wonder why I'm passionate about this. I wonder why, you know, I, I am so dedicated to these ideas or these causes or these different things. And I think often it's because it's where we put our treasure. And it's where we've made sometimes conscious choices, but sometimes it's unconscious choices where to put, put it there. And I think our hearts, in essence, are following the trail of where we invest the most, where we invest our resources, our time, our money, and our energy. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to explore how this principle unfolds in our lives, what that really looks like for each of us. And uh, we'll dive into the wisdom of scriptures, we'll examine some of these truths, and how we can store up treasures in heaven, okay? And uh, it should be exciting, because this series isn't just merely about like financial stewardship, so if you're like, oh man, he's going to ask us for money, that's not the goal in this, okay? Uh, but I think it's understanding that it's about stewardship of our hearts, about what we invest in in our hearts and so it's about understanding our choices our investments our priorities and that that reflects our affections and discovering how we can align our hearts to the heart of God for where our heart is that's where our true home is and uh, so if we do this I pray that you're just kind of open that you're not super critical um, and that you're a little uncomfortable okay because as I've been getting into this I'm like man I'm a little uncomfortable and there's things in this where you're like, I don't know, I'm wrestling and I'm trying to figure it out. And so this is not one of those where you're like, oh, do like I'm doing because I have it all figured out. That's not where we're at, okay? We're at a point of going, hey, God clearly calls us to this. And I'm praying that God blesses us and guides us through this, that we have a deep understanding of him, his kingdom, and that our, true, our hearts truly find our home in him. And um, I want to be really, really clear, though. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into giving. That is not the goal. Uh, and now's like the perfect time. We just got done with our special missions uh, kind of season. Uh, our, our location here, you know, we had a pledge, kind of what we were trying to do. We blew that out. We gave like 130% of what our goal was. So I go, that's really encouraging. Amen, absolutely. Give, a, give, an, a, give an applause there. You know, and, and so I go, that was encouraging. Our, our weekly contribution, like what people give in the plates, we're, we're right on par. We're, we've been really consistent out the whole year. I'm really grateful for all of you guys doing that. So this isn't like, oh my gosh, you guys, we're behind. And that's not it at all. But I think Jesus Christ talked more about money than any other single subject in all of the scriptures. And when it comes to a person's real nature, I think money is pretty important. And money is the exact index of a person's true character. Because 
uh, you know, there's this, there's this correlation between our character in the Bible and how we handle God's money. And I think we got to acknowledge God's total ownership of our earthly resources, of our money, our time, and our talent. And what's funny is the older I get, the more I'd much rather give somebody my money than my time. I'm like, I'd rather pay that kid to do my lawn than have to do it myself. Absolutely. And so if you go, oh, I give contribution, but I don't, don't ask me to do something, this, is, this, this one's for you too, okay? So this is all of it, right? If you go, if you think you're getting out of, getting out of jail free, nope. Um, because I think in the broadest definition, stewardship has to do with how we handle our time, our talent, and our treasure. And Jesus knew that money and possessions goes right to the center of our hearts, of our faith, of our trust, of our security, of our fears. And it touches the heart of our spiritual journey. It touches every part of who we are. And I think this is the reason that Jesus devoted twice as many verses about money than he did about heaven and hell combined. Five times more about money than prayer. There are 500 verses about prayer and faith and 2,000 about money. Of 16 of Jesus' 38 parables, talk about money. And so, again, as we're looking at this, a lot of this is going to come from this book. It's, uh, it's been super helpful for me. It's been a little convicting, um, which I know is always good because there's times where I look at this and I go, oh, I don't like that, which is a healthy place to be because we're being shaped and molded by God, right? And so, uh, you know, that all of our life, we've been on a treasure hunt. We're looking for this perfect place. We're looking for this perfect person right? And if we're a Christian, if we're a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, we found the perfect person. It's Jesus. And that perfect place is heaven. And nothing else compares, right? And so there's a problem, though, that we're not living with that person yet. We're not living in that place yet. And so we, we go, yeah, I, I attend church. I pray regularly. I read the Bible. But you can look at your life and go, oh, it feels like a drudgery sometimes, or it doesn't feel super inspiring. It doesn't feel like what's going on is what, uh, what you're longing for. And I think Jesus addresses many times this missing element of this hidden, of missing part of the story. And uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, in verses 19 through 20, he talks about this principle here that's been buried and, and what happens. And, and uh, in verse 19, he says this. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And he's saying, hey, where you're putting your time, where you're putting your treasures, where you're putting your money, where you put all this stuff, it, it, your heart is directly tied to it. And he does a great job in, this, in the book there having this story of an of a early first century uh, Jewish person who's walking through a field. And uh, it, he doesn't own the field, but he's traveling and he's late and he's exhausted and he's got his staff and he's walking through there. And he's like, you know what, I can cut through this. The, the landowner won't mind. This is something that is allowed. And as he's walking through, he's, he's getting more and more frustrated that he's late for work and he's got to do this. And all, this, all the life and stress and worries that can happen. The bills that are due and the things, the expectations that people have on him. I don't know if you've ever been in this spot, right? Where you're driving your little, you know, first. So he's got his staff and each step he takes as he's drudging along is getting more aggressive as he hits the ground. And he hits the ground and all of a sudden he hears, dunk. He's like, what, what is that? And so he kind of looks a little bit and he pounds it again and he, dunk. And he starts to move the dirt and he sees something flat, and as he moves it more, he starts to see some metal, and he sees some engraving on this, and now he's kind of excited. And he starts to tear this thing open, and as he's digging in there, he goes, wow, there's a chest. And he opens this chest up, and it's full of gold and silver and jewels. And he's like, this is pretty cool. And he looks around, and there's nobody there. He's like, ooh, but I'm a good God-fearing person, I'm gonna bury this thing back up and I'm gonna go see if I can buy this land. And so at that time, as you know, Jesus is sharing this, like, hey, don't worry about moths and thieves and coming in. There was no banks. People would hide money under their mattress or bury it somewhere. And so he's like, somebody must have buried this, died. This has been a vacant piece of land for years. And as he's going, leaving from there, he's like, I gotta figure out how to buy this. So he's like, you know, if I sold everything I have, if I sold my house, if I sold my, my ox, if I sold all of my tools, if I just, if I got rid of everything, I think it might be enough to buy this. And he is excited. He is not going away trying to think of like, oh, this is such a bummer. I have to do this. No, no, no. 
He, he goes, I, I'm, I'm so excited about this. What an unbelievable find. I can figure out how to do this. And from that moment of the discovery, this guy's life changes. This treasure captures his imagination. It's his reference point. It's his new center of gravity. And as he takes every step, this treasure in his mind, he's experienced this radical paradigm shift. And Jesus catches this story just in one line. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, this isn't an example of like how to steal some somebody's stuff, right? But this was a normal thing, and there's treasures that are in there. There's stories over the years of exactly this thing, this kind of thing happening. But, but in there, he's going, hey, finding this treasure. And there's some who would say that Jesus' statement here in Matthew 13 refers to people finding the treasure of Jesus himself, which I go, that's absolutely true. There's a treasure there. There's others who would say that Jesus is referring to his own sacrifice of obtaining the treasure uh, of the people and the kingdom that he rules. And in either case, it certainly portrays the joy of finding eternal treasure with the value that far surpasses the cost of obtaining it. And so the parable of this hidden treasure is just one of many references that Jesus made about money. And Jesus taught more about money and wealth and all, than all other social issues, more, about mar- more than about marriage, more than about politics, more than about work or sex or power. And his teachings about money stand in a discussion of discipleship and just our loyalty to God. So why did Jesus put such an emphasis on money and possessions? Well, I think because there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives, how we think about money, how we handle it, and I think we may try to divorce our faith from our finances, but God sees them in, as inseparable. And what's interesting, if you look in, in, um, in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is preaching. He's preparing the way for Jesus. He's going out there. He is calling people names, like the super religious people. And, uh, and, and he goes, you know, all these people, there's these different groups that they're coming in there. He says, hey, what... What, what should we do to bear fruit of our repentance in our lives? And John gives three answers here. In uh, John chapter 3, verse 11, he says, John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So, Each of these answers relates to money and possessions, and not one of those people asked about it, right? So he gives us three things right here. He says, hey, anybody, we should share our clothes. We should should go here. Let's like slide. Um, Tax collectors shouldn't pocket extra money. Shoulders should be content with their wages and not extort. So why didn't John talk about other things? Why do you go, "Why, why are you bringing this up? Because I think our approach to money and possessions isn't just important, it's central to our spiritual lives, and we don't want it to be. I don't want it to be. I hate even having to talk about this, because I'm like, (laughs) God's going to mess with me. I know he will, right? And yet, that's what I signed up for when I made Jesus Lord, that he gets to mess with every area of my life, even my finances. And, you know, it's such a high priority to God that John the Baptist couldn't talk about spirituality without talking about how they handled the money and their possessions, And it jumps out in all these other passages. So I'm just going to refer to a couple right here. Luke 19 and verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up. He was this tax collector. He says, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times that amount. Right? Like he is like, I am motivated in this. Jesus' response to this, he says, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And Jesus, Zacchaeus' approach to money, how he handled this, it showed that his heart had been transformed. And don't we just want to go, yeah, but my heart should be transformed and it don't have to show any actions behind it. Right? I mean, that would be so nice, right? But it's all throughout scriptures. Like, I don't have the scriptures here. You can look it up later. But Acts chapter 2, there's these, in Jerusalem, there's people who are converted. They eagerly sold their possessions to give to the poor. Uh, In Ephesians, there's these occultists who come, they become Christians, they're like, let's pile all these books, let's burn them, worth millions of dollars today. There's a poor widow who who goes, I'm going to give two small copper coins, less than a penny, that all I have to live on. And Jesus goes, man, this person, 
out of her poverty gives everything she has to live in. But then there's also times where Jesus talks about people who are wealthy. Because there's this stark contrast uh, of the rich young ruler, right? With, he has all this wealth, and so he plans to tear down his barns and build bigger ones and uh, storing up for himself so he could retire early and take life easy. And in Luke chapter 12, it talks about that. It says, but God called this man a fool, saying, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? Like, oh. And yet, even this week, Anna and I, was, we were preparing for this, talking about, oh. But what about saving for the future and saving for my kids and saving for all that? Do I need to feel bad about that? And I'm wrestling through this in my heart, right? But one of the greatest indictments that Jesus brings against somebody is this rich young ruler who, he, who asked Jesus, hey, how do I inherit eternal life? And after assuring Jesus that he was a devout follower of the law, that he did all the right things, uh, the man obsessed with, was obsessed with earthly treasures, though, and Jesus called him something uh, to something higher, in, a, in Mark chapter 10, in verse 21, he says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. You lack one thing, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. See, Jesus knew that money and possessions were this man's God. And he realized that the man wouldn't serve God until he was dethroned, this money idol. But the seeker considered the price too great, and he walks away sad. And Jesus knew that this rich young ruler could not serve both God and money. And I think, sadly, this rich young ruler, he walks away, and he misses out, and he doesn't inherit this eternal life that God has for him. At least, we don't know in the story. And Jesus lets him walk away. But he's like, oh, he came and he asked, shouldn't Jesus chase him down? He goes, nope, I'm not going to. Because this, this rich young ruler wasn't willing to do and sell for something greater. But the man in the parable of this hidden treasure, he goes, no, 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 I'm going to sell everything to get this eternal thing, to get what's, what's going to be greater and this greater treasure that's coming. And we don't feel sorry for the traveler in the field who discovered the hidden treasure. We recognize that, that he had gained so much more than he was about to lose, right? You don't look at him and go, oh, that's such a bummer. Because literally the scripture says in his joy, he goes away and sells everything he has. He wasn't exchanging a lesser trevor, treasure. He was exchanging his lesser treasure for greater treasures. And not out of drudgery, not out of like, oh, I have to do this again, but out of joyful exhilaration. And I think in this parable, Jesus is appealing to us, saying, what do you value? Do you value temporary earthly treasures? And I think in order to make this analogy that he says, no, 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 you should value eternal heavenly treasures. And we should think of this, this treasure hidden in the field in Matthew 13 as representing the true and lasting treasures that we find in Jesus, in the gospel, in God's eternal kingdom. Yes, all of that. And any tr earthly treasures that we part with to obtain far greater treasures is absolutely worth it. But I think there's also a, a, an important key to start, like all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. In uh, Genesis 1, in verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? God, God created all of this. So it's his. In uh, Psalm 24, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He goes, no, no, all of this is mine. All of this is, is what I have prepared. So it's God's, and yet he asks us to be, take a part in this, right? Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. And you think about it and you go, well, man, couldn't I, like, be awesome if I could get that, if I could just pray and, and have that as well, right? Leviticus 25 in verse 23, it says, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you reside in the land as foreigners and as strangers. There's so much in the Old Testament that talks about all of this is God's. It's in the New Testament too. 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So what does God claim to own? All of it. All of it. And this is where I start to really bristle, right? So you're like, you're not the boss of me. Right? It's one of my favorite things to say to my wife. She'll remind me of something very lovingly. She'll, she'll, you know, like, hey, would you? And I'll look at her, and she'll, like, I know what you're thinking. And I'm like, you're right. You're not the boss of me. And uh, it's become playful over the years. And we can mess, and over the years, 
She, she clarified that one for all of us. But I think there's that heart in me, and I don't know if it's in you, but I'm guessing it is because we all have the same kind of heart, that I can look and God wants me to do something and I go, ooh, but you're not the boss of me. And we would never say that to God, but sometimes my actions really shown it because he created it, he made it, he owns it, and more than that, he sustains it. The Bible tells us in Colossians that God holds everything together by the power of Jesus, and, and he keeps the planets in line, and God owns it, he made it, he sustains it. And the fact that God owns everything means he also owns me, and he owns you. He owns the land, he owns everything because he made it, he made the raw materials that made all that, and I go, Rrr. And in Genesis, he creates all of the earth and all of, all of the humans and everything that he created. And, and of all of his creation, only mankind is made in his image. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So he goes, hey, hey, you're made in my image. You're like God, but you're not God. But we have the character of God. And we have a different role, a different job description. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, he says he took the man and put him in the garden and to work it and take care of it. So why did God make us? I think one, yes, to, to love us and have relationship with it, but he also said to take care of the earth. That we're supposed to be caretakers. We're supposed to manage this. We're supposed to be stewards of all of this good resources. And he says, hey, increase in number. He also told that to all the animals, right? And so he talks about this. He goes, fill the earth, procreate. And he told that to the animals, but then he adds additional things for us. And the only one that we've been able to actually follow is to procreate. It's the only, only command of God, I think, that hasn't been broken, Right? <laughs> But he said, to the earth, subdue it, rule over it, work it, take care of it. Who is the first environmentalist? God, okay? And so if you got an attitude with that, don't. But, but, but go, ultimately, God owns everything, right? But I'm his money manager. You go, but wait, 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 I'm supposed to co-work with God with this. I'm, I'm given these things, but they're God's. He doesn't even give them to me. He entrusts them to me. Because all of the things that we have are not mine. And that's where I get messed up. I go, no, it is mine, right? I act like the two-year-old who is, goes to somebody's house, and there's a toy there. They pick it up, and the other two-year-old who comes over and wants to take that toy, and what does that first two-year-old say? Mine. Absolutely. It is in our nature to go, it's mine. I found it. I was given it. I did not create it, but it's mine. And so we forget that we're created for. We forget our purpose. And man goes out and manages what God has been given us and created. And pretty soon we start to think that we own it. We get used to it. We manage it. And, and we enjoy all these resources. But God still owns it. See, you are God's manager on earth. We're partners with God. 1 Corinthians 3.19 uh, says, So we're co-workers with God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And the more we give, the more we get to, to co-work with God, the more we get to delight in that, the more that we're walking alongside with him and, and, and it gives and pleases us. And, but I think more importantly, it pleases God, right? In, in, Acts, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So you go, yeah, God goes, I don't want you to give because you have to, you're checking a box, but because you're joyfully giving back. And again, not just money, because many of us will go, I'll give you my money. Don't ask for my time. Don't ask for what I really treasure. And God goes, here's the thing. I want it all. I don't need any of it, but I want it all. Because he knows that if he, we don't give it his all, we're holding back, and it messes with our heart. And that, but what's interesting in this scripture, it doesn't mean that you only have to give when you're cheerful about it. Right? I think cheerfulness often comes during and after the act of obedience, sometimes not before. So don't wait till you feel like doing it. Figure out how to do it and watch the joy that follows. Because God delights in our cheerfulness and giving. He wants us to find joy in this. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 commands us to rejoice in him and rejoice in this. And, and what command could be, be greater than that? To just go give. God is the original giver and he calls us to give just like he gave. And I think we're robbed of this great source of joy that God wants to give to us when we don't give. And here's something super interesting. 
the Macedonian church, the Macedonian Christians, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 2, I want to look at a little bit of this because their mindset in giving, man, it convicts me and calls me higher. In chapter 8, verse 2, it says, In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So how do severe trial, overflowing joy, and extreme poverty and rich generosity fit together? Because I go, I read those and I go, yeah, no, not at all, right? You're like, if I win the lottery, uh, then I'd be extremely generous, right? Although history shows that that's not the case either, right? And what's, what's convicting here in one of the, my favorite lines from this book that it says in here, it says, giving isn't a luxury of the rich, it's a privilege of the poor. Giving isn't a luxury of the rich, it's a privilege of the poor. And these Macedonian Christians who were in extreme poverty refused to let hard circumstances keep them from that joy. It's convicting because I don't even know what extreme poverty looks like. And what's interesting, I was talking with my sister who we had a family reunion years ago, and we were talking about different things and thanking my parents for who they were and raising us. And, but it wasn't until I got out of the house and away and figured out some things were not normal that I go, we kind of grew up poor. But I didn't know that at the time. I always had food. I always had clothes. I can tell you the very first pair of pants that I had that were bought from the store and weren't given to me, though, too. And I go, but I never knew it. I don't know what this is to have extreme poverty, and yet we can look at this and go, ooh, I don't know. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 4, it says, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to God's people. So here's something. They had to urge. They had to plead. They're like, let us give. Why? I think because they were super poor, and Paul goes, you don't have to do this. Good grief. Don't, don't give. And they're like, no, 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 we have to. We want to. We want to do this. And they had this example. They were dirt poor, and yet they came up with every reason they could give. And yet in my heart, I go and live in the richest country in the world, and I can easily come up with every excuse why I shouldn't have to give. Can you relate to that at all? Convicting that they begged for this privilege to give. What a contrast to us. What a contrast to me. We have so much. We're given all these different things, and we can come up with endless justifications of not giving. Again, our treasure, time, money, resources. And it's humbling to receive gifts from people who are far greater need than we have, right? We've had a great honor of being able to visit some very poor countries and seeing and helping and and serving. And to see people's joy who have almost nothing in giving you something is like one of the most humbling things I've ever experienced. And they're not pretending about the sacrifice. Like, they're really happy, and they really enjoy it. And it's something that you go, ah. Like, the best example of this that I had was I I went to Poland as a teenager and worked at this UNESCO American language camp, and one one of the families of one of the kids that was there wanted to have us over for dinner. And this was still, like, under the Iron Curtain before, so kind of under communism. And uh, we, we go to dinner at this house, and they serve us this food. And I put, I put that in quotation marks because they plop this thing down on my table, and my brother, who's four years older with me, takes his knife, cuts his in half, and, like, plops one on my mom's plate, like, immediately. And I was like, what is happening? And it was this thing called salts. And it was this gelatin thing with... They had bought a, a head of a pig, boiled it, taken the meat off of that, and put it in jello, clear jello, and that was the meal. It's maybe the worst thing I've ever put in my mouth other than balut, uh, which is like fermented duck eggs, fertilized duck eggs. Don't do those. And, and I'm sitting there going, and the, and the other person that was with us who the parents didn't speak English, they're like, you have to eat that. And I was like, uh, no, I don't. And they're like, you don't understand. They used two months' worth of meat rations to buy that so that you could have meat at this meal and not just vegetables. This will be super offensive if you don't eat this. So I ate that. I didn't have Jell-O for like 20 years. (laughs) I'm not kidding. 
Like, I was like, oh. <laughs> My stomach gets a little queasy even just talking about it. <laughs> but it's humbling, right, to go, literally, they gave what they didn't have to. And I'm like, this is gross. How privileged am I in that, right? And I'm guessing at this point, if you're like me, you are feeling something, okay? And you're probably feeling like, how dare he? Maybe, I don't know. Or maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Or maybe you're feeling defensive. Or maybe you're feeling guilty. Or cynical. Or frustrated. Or just like, why is he going to shut up? (laughs) Or maybe you're looking at me and rightfully judging, like, I know what he spent on this, and he didn't honor God with that. You're right, I'm sure. You wouldn't be wrong. And I am not saying have this all this figured out. What I'm saying is the world seeps in, and the world changes us, and it's not for the better. And this isn't a, I'm better. This is a, hey, I got to reorientate my compass back to the compass and the heart of Jesus, because there's so many things that pull us off and mess with our heads. Because materialism seeks in, and it messes with our hearts, and it literally pulls us And it pulls our hearts away from the home God wants our hearts to be. We live in the richest country in the world, and we are surrounded by stuff. If you have extra stuff, like extra clothes and extra food and change in your car or in your sofa, you are part of the richest part of the world, period. And it doesn't feel like that way, and we want to go, but, 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 and I do too. We. This is we. This is not you. The me, right? And so what's hard is that we can feel stressed out and controlled by all this stuff. And so giving becomes freeing. It literally gives us freedom. And it's a matter of basic physics, right? Cue the slide for minds. Which formula is this? Newton's law of gravitational pull, right? Well done. I was going to be super disappointed if somebody didn't know it, by the way. You don't have to know it, right? You're like, but, but ultimately it says, hey, this force is gravity times the mass of object one times the mass of object two and the distance between those masses. So basically what it's saying is the closer you get to a planet, the more that planet will kind of pull you. And our stuff, and if that's not right, tell somebody else later, okay? But... Um, <laughs> Take a picture and send it to your buddies and go, dude, they're talking about physics at church. Um, But what I think this is saying is there's a gravitational pull from our stuff, mass one. And the more stuff you have, the more it pulls on mass two, and the more that that just pulls you in, right? Does that make sense? And you go, it's why, like, there's, you know, earth that, as things are spinning around and it gets closer and closer and it crashes in. Because the greater the mass, the greater the the hold that that mass exerts. And the more things we own, the greater their total mass, and the more they grip us. And the setting, and it orbits our life around them. And the closer we are to stuff, the more the pull. Until finally it becomes this black hole that pulls us in. And I think giving changes all of that. It breaks us out of the orbit of our possessions. We escape the gravity of that. And entering a new orbit around the treasures in heaven. And Paul, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, says this. It says, now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. How, is that the right one? You know, how was God's grace demonstrated? It was by their act of giving to needy Christians. You know, in verse 6, Paul calls the Macedonians giving to help those hungry in Jerusalem this act of grace. The same Greek word is used for, for this, this Christian giving is the same word for God's grace in sending Jesus. Christ's grace defines and it motivates and it puts in perspective our giving. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. See, our giving should be a reflexive response to the grace of God in our lives. It doesn't come out of altruism or philanthropy or guilt or a pledged card. It doesn't. It comes out of the transforming work of Jesus Christ in us. And this grace 
is an action. Our giving is the reaction. Right? We give because he first gave to us. And the greatest passage on giving in all of scriptures is in 2 Corinthians 9. You can look over and read that whole chapter, the whole thing. And he ends it with it, not congratulations for your generosity, but he says, he ends with this, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift that we got to give. In his book, Alcorn says, as thunder follows lightning, giving follows grace. And when God's grace touches you, you can't help but respond with generous giving. And again, not just finances, but of all of who we are. And as the Macedonians knew, giving is, is simply the overflow of joy in this. And so here's what I want to do, is I'm going to give you homework for this week. And uh, you're going to have to take a picture of this or have somebody else get there. But I want you to, to spend at least one day praying about this and asking God. Because I think there's a great prompt right here. It says, time and again in your word, Lord, you make a direct connection between experiencing grace and expressing grace through giving. Grace is your lightning, and giving is our thunder in response. So here's my question as we're asking God. Has the degree of my giving suggested that I've recognized and embraced the full extent of your grace in my life? Or does it suggest I need to recognize and respond to your grace in a deeper and more helpful way? And there's a couple of scriptures there at the end. And pray that prayer. But also be willing to hear what God has to say. This isn't me trying to guilt anybody into doing anything. Again, we're doing okay. Could we always use more money? Absolutely. Would I ever say no? No. But I think it all has to do with our heart before God and saying, hey, God, what's, what's the gravitational pull of this stuff versus the gravitational pull of Jesus in my life? Because as Christians, we should respond to that grace and give. But I think first we need to respond to the gift of Jesus at the cross. It's why we take communion. It's why we remember him. Because we need to accept that gift of Jesus' forgiveness of our sins. And as we take communion... I really want you to consider and remember the gifts of grace, the love, the sacrifice from the creator of all things who gives us all we need to live godly lives and who sustains all things. And I, as we pray this week, I pray that God just shows you not how you can feel guilty and give more, but how you can be freed from the things that are going to pull you down and pull you back and really have great joy in your heart by giving as God has given to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we take communion here and as we think about all the ways that you've blessed us and helped us, God, I, I pray, Father, that, that you would really help us consider and ask questions of you. God, not in a question of uh, we think we know better, but questions of how, how can we look and live our life in response to your grace? God, help that grace be the action that really does produce a reaction in us. God, I know that we're not saved because of our good deeds. We're not saved because we give. And yet you call us to have good deeds and you call us to give. And God, help us not to make excuses. Help to open our hearts. Help us to have a humility. Help us not to have a judgmental heart that looks and points out in other people, but that yet first and foremost looks at our own hearts. And God, there's so many scriptures that talk about how we'll be judged by what we do or don't do how we respond in using of the things that you've given us. And God, I pray that each one of us would have time now to reflect and think and pray and ask, and most importantly, listen to you of, of where you feel like our hearts are at and how we can respond and how we can embrace that grace that you've given us, God. I'm so grateful for the forgiveness of sin, so grateful for all the amazing gifts that you've lavished upon us also grateful that you allow us to give back to others, to feel one of the most important parts of who you are in giving back to others. God, bless this time of communion. Help us to remember and embrace the forgiveness. And, and even if we go, man, I know there's a guilt in there of things that I haven't given or greedy that greedy or materialism or, or things that we, we know we've hold, held on to. I'm grateful that Jesus' blood covers over all those sins as well. Help us embrace it. Help us to be different. 
Holy Spirit. It's in, his, it's in Jesus' name we pray.